All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Office Hours. My name is Apurva Ashok. Um, I am the project lead at the Rebus community, and I'm joined today by Karen Lortzen and Barbara Thies from the Open Education Network. For those of you who don't know, Rebus is a Canadian charity um, that offers programs, resources, um, and um, other types of uh, publishing support and services for your OER projects and efforts, um, regardless of whether you're based in Canada or somewhere else in the world. Today, we'll be talking about um, how to engage student leaders in OER. Uh, this is actually part two of um, a two-part series. And if you missed last month's session about engaging administrative leaders, um, I will encourage you to watch the recording and recap. Um, our speakers from last session uh, really gave us some wonderful tips and strategies for how you can think about some of those administrative stakeholders in OER and how to really engage them um, when it comes to your strategic planning. If this is your first time attending office hours, I will let you know that um, it's an informal conversation. Uh, really, our format is to hear from guests for about five minutes um, each, and then after 15, 20 minutes or so, we'll turn things over to you to drive the conversation with your questions, with your experiences, with your thoughts. Um, and uh, I will also flag that we are always open to suggestions when it comes to speakers um, and topics as well. So I will drop into the chat um, a link to a form where you can provide your feedback and suggestions um, if you're looking for us to cover a particular topic um, in 2021. If you'd like to be a speaker or if you know of someone who will be an excellent speaker, um, you can always let us know in the form um, that I've just linked to. So Karen, I will turn it over to you to um, introduce our great lineup of guests today and maybe also share a little bit more about the Open Education Network. Thanks, Aprova, and hello everyone. I'm Karen Lawrenson with the Open Education Network along with Barb Thies. And the OEN is a community of professionals who are working together to move open education forward. Primarily in the United States, we have members um, representing around, Barb, is it 1,500 institutions now? Um, around 1,300, mostly in the US, but also Canada and Australia. Thank you. And uh, we share uh, best practices and resources in order to support open ed programs and practices. So as Aperva said, this is an informal conversation. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of you. As our guests share their experience and expertise, please feel free to talk amongst yourselves or start asking questions in the chat. We will keep an eye on chat and um, facilitate conversation from there as well. So without further ado, I will let you know the four guests who are here with us and then turn things over to them one by one. Our four guests today are Akanksha Bhatnagar. She is communications and public relations officer with the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. Nikki Godfrey, who is assistant commissioner for public affairs with the Board of Regents at the state of Louisiana. Nicholas or Nick Seng Stocken, Chancellor's Fellow, Office of the Chancellor at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Leticia Nunez Campos, who is a fourth year medical student at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at Universidad de Pernambuco. So to get us started, I will turn things over to Akanksha. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for being here and thanks so much for having me. Uh, like mentioned, my name is Kanksha. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Communications and Public Relations Officer at the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. Kind of a mouthful, um, but essentially what we do is we're a student lobby organization uh, that is run effectively by 23 student associations across Canada who have student delegates that let us know what their priorities are. And for the past about, I would say, seven to eight years, one of our big priorities has been copyright and open education issues, simply because students are so interested in the concept of open um, and free textbooks, honestly, but we try to rope them in, in terms of the research side as well. And we represent anywhere from undergraduate students in Canada to polytechnics and trades and to graduate students as well. Um, I also got involved in student leadership when I was at the University of Alberta. I served as the VP academic there and chair of the open education um, advocacy group where we worked with our university administration to develop um, OER policies for our campus and work on projects like 
ZTC textbook course cost indicators, um, but also while I was a student leader, what I started to learn a lot more about was the intersection of EDI or equity, diversity, and inclusivity when it comes to open educational resources. And so um, I got involved, thankfully, through a colleague that I, I someone who's really close to my heart, who's also on the call, Haley Babb, who is an incredible student leader, um, formerly from University of Lethbridge, and now is with Spark. And I think she's taken me under her wing and has been able to teach me a lot because I uh, do a lot of work with the Open Education um, Conference that you might have heard of, and, and also am on the EDI uh, Open Stacks Advisory Committee. Um, so I try to delve a little bit into the American side, but I primarily am focused on open education advocacy here in Canada, which is, um, you know, as we were talking about prior to the call starting, is so different than America, however, is often uh, correlated. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm super excited to learn from everyone and have conversations with folks. Thanks so much, Akanksha. And over to you, Nikki. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to join this wonderful conversation today. I'm Nikki Godfrey, and I serve as the Assistant Commissioner for Public Affairs at the Louisiana Board of Regents. And that is a state agency in Louisiana uh, that coordinates all of public higher education for our state. We have four systems and 32 institutions kind of under our umbrella here at Regents. And I've been at Regents about five years, and I think one of the most important things we've done within that time is to have added the Louisiana Library Network, or LEWIS, we have an acronym for everything, to our team. Um, LEWIS is a consortium of public and private college and university libraries in our state. Um, and the partnership was formed by library deans and directors to create a cost-effective collaboration among our institutions for the procurement of library and technology resources. So Lewis is under the direction of Dr. Terry Galloway, who I love and I think has um, interacted with this group, is currently 47 members strong. Um, in addition to uh, the addition of Lewis to our Regents team has allowed for an increased level of collaboration between the library services, our students, and our institutions across the state. So through Lewis and their Affordable Learning Louisiana initiative, um, they've been able to partner with libraries and faculty to save students money by reducing the cost of instructional materials, so speaking the language, um, through AERs and OERs and other open access materials. And so it ensured that our students um, has, have equitable, equitable access to course materials um, from the beginning, from their first day of classes. So to date, this initiative has served over 126,000 students, saving over $26 million. The specifics of that are, I'll leave to the experts in that area, but they are online and available at lewislibraries.org, the website. And Emily Frank from that team is on the call today. So Emily can drop that in the chat for you guys as well. But what I'd like to add to this conversation is a short dialogue on how we've been able to use our students and the power of the student voice to advocate for OER. I'm also pleased to be able to serve as an advisor for Louisiana's Council of Student Body Presidents. The Council of Student Body Presidents, again, acronym, you'll hear me say COSP, um, was formed to promote communication among the students and our member schools to further educational and social interest and to support the advancement of higher education around the state. So our council serves as a representative body for those students at our colleges and universities that belong to our four systems. Uh, and they work with us to convey their thoughts, their opinions, their needs, their wants. Um, and they let us know how we can improve the lives of students and maintain a strong working relationship among our students. So we gather monthly with our student leaders, our student body presidents from each of our 32 institutions. Uh, they engage in leadership development sessions and we meet to ensure that our students know are in the know on all relevant issues impacting students and that they also have concrete methods to spread news and awareness to their respective student bodies on their campuses. So when Terry and Lewis reached out to us to ask for support from COSP for OER initiatives, um, we were delighted to have that partnership and to expand our engagement with them. And as much as I think we know what students want and how we communicate with them, We've learned quickly that it's better to let students hear from students and hear from them in the language that they speak to each other. So whether that's been having students to testify in front of the state legislature, or even having our students stomp the hill on Capitol Hill to, to advocate for affordability to our congressional delegation, we continue to advance the power of the student voice. We often use the hashtags, listen to the students, and it's all about the students, and we are intentional about living that out. 
So to encourage OER use and promotion, we first had to ensure our students understood the benefits and what that was. Um, during that time, initially, we were in person in meetings, but now over Zoom, we allow students to ask questions, to engage, to hear from our experts, and we also ask them what methods they think may be best to spread the news to their peers. I don't want to take too much time going into specifics on that now, happy to answer any questions, but some of those initiatives that our students have engaged um, to spread the news about OER have included student videos on social media, on campus campaigns, um, and we have provided graphic design and support material for campus use. So in closing, the collaboration between Lewis, our library network, and CASP, our student body president organization from around the state, has been beneficial um, for our state and for the promotion of OER initiatives in Louisiana. And by the way, my dissertation topic was in student engagement. So these conversations excite me. I could probably talk about this all day. But again, thank you for allowing me to join you today to talk about um, OER and our students and um, our student advocates for OER and our student engagement. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much, Nikki. And Nick, over to you. Awesome. Well, hey all, my name is Nick Sangstack and I'm, I'm incredibly honored to be on this call. Um, it, it, it's so refreshing to see so many people excited about OER and first of all, so uh, refreshing to hear people want to engage students on OER. I think so many times we hear about, oh, this is a library conversation, this is an admin conversation. No, this is a student conversation. It impacts students and they need to be engaged. So thank you. Um, as a former student myself, thank you. Um, but uh, as, as I already mentioned, uh, my current position, I'm, I'm currently at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I graduated in May. I'm serving as a Chancellor's Fellow. Uh, but my experience in OER um, really goes back um, to uh, my time as a student. Starting my freshman year, I was um, the uh, affordability coordinator for NC PERG on our campus, ended up um, becoming um, vice chair of that organization, and, and uh, as well as the affordability co-chair in our student government, our undergraduate chief of staff, and then also found um, roles on the national level in the United States, uh, working with US PERG, um, and was really fortunate to work on a, on a number of, um, of initiatives really led by the student voice. Um, at Carolina, we unveiled our textbook affordability pledge, which we were able to uh, uh, gather over 350 faculty partners to work with students to um, improve practices on our campus. We also were able to work with admin to stop an inclusive access program on our campus um, and increase uh, the use of open materials um, throughout that conversation. And what I will say is as, as I speak today, I think it's really important to note that OER is not a singular issue. There's all these different factors that impact it. Uh, and as, as we talk about it, we need to include uh, things like access codes, um, like the textbook affordability um, issue overall is incredibly important here um, because um, moving, to, uh, working with a faculty member to move them to OER, it's not just about that. It's about what material are you currently using? Why are you currently using that material? And how can we move you to something that is going to be better. Um, and that might not always be an OER. Uh, there might be a, a step or two in between between an access code and OER. So I just want to mention that. Uh, but I also went on to work on the national level to fight back against the Sengage McGraw-Hill merger, the failed Sengage McGraw-Hill merger. Um, and most recently, um, as, a, as a Chancellor's Fellow, was able to unveil our class features program at Carolina, um, which is we're really proud is to say is one of the most expansive um, course marking programs in the country, which includes open syllabi, course costs. So really proud about that. Um, but when I uh, talk about kind of how to engage student leaders, I do want to mention um, student leaders aren't always student government. They're not always from organizations. They're not always affiliated with anyone. Sometimes they might just be a student who's walking through the pit after leaving the student stores and saying, oh my God, that textbook was expensive. Why am I doing this? That can be a student leader. It can be anyone. And that's how I got involved. I was um, actually registering students to vote for the 2016 election and NC Perk said, hey, do you think textbooks are too expensive? I said, yeah. Um, and uh, next thing I knew, I was advocating for that. So uh, really remember that this it's not always about working with student government. It's working with students. Um, and as I think about student engagement, I think there's three really important points I want to touch on. Um, the first is um, when you work with students, it's really important to simplify the OER message. Um, OER is daunting. No one knows what it means, uh, unfortunately. So when we go on campus, I think it's as simple as it sounds, using terms like open textbooks um, and, and really framing it in a message that's easy to understand and that's approachable, um, and, but also humanizing the message. Um, at Carolina, a lot of our support with, um, with our textbook pledge came from kind of framing it from an affordability lens and saying, um, yeah, textbooks are too expensive. We feel your pain. Here's a great solution. And here's why it's so great. Um, and the next point I think is, is important is when you move on and you're able to kind of 
um, bring people to the conversation with the, a simple message that, that humanizes the issues, then it's important to have uh, data and, and fact-driven arguments. So um, at Carolina, we kept constant uh, metrics on how much were our students actually spending on textbooks per year. Um, when we started our work with the textbook pledge, um, the average cost of textbooks at Carolina was about $1,600 Per year, which is not good. Um, thankfully, um, after uh, when I graduated, it was down to to 972, and it's it's continuing to fall. So we're we're seeing those things, but keeping a, an eye on those metrics and using them in your conversations is is, is crucial. And, and also giving students uh, the the tools necessary. So giving them the facts, being transparent is is really important. Uh, and then um, the third point I, I, I mention all the time is is really um, not students don't really understand. And I certainly didn't um, before coming and being an admiral. I didn't understand how the institution worked. I didn't know who was reporting to whom. And, and so, um, first of all, giving students those tools, but also working with students to help them understand those institutional um, kind of positions and, and who reports to who and why. Um, and then, if you are working with student leaders in the student government, um, expressing them what their role is and why, how, why it's so important. Um, I, I didn't realize how, how critical a student, my student government role was until I was there. And um, I, I had people on other issues coming to me and say, hey, you're in this codified position that is on uh, task force committees at this institution. This is why it's so important in the work you're doing. And I think framing it in that way is, is, is crucial. Um, so again, I, I could talk for hours. If you all have any questions, um, Please, of course, shoot them off in the, in the chat. But thank you so much for having me and, and, and beyond honored and humbled. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. And Leticia. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Karen, thank you for introducing me. I'm Leticia Campos, and I'm one of the current members of of Incisions International Team and General Secretary of Incision Brazil. And I was really delighted to receive this invitation to join you all today. And before I share with you my experiences, I just wanted to say something very briefly before I tell you all. So when we talk about open science, we usually focus on the research outputs. We focus on opening the access to articles. We focus on opening data, opening sources, opening educational resources. But at the end, open science is not about only opening the research outputs. It's about what kind of people do you want to produce science, to contribute to science. This is the main point of open science, is to give power to those who doesn't have and wish to contribute to science. So in this sense, if students are capable of contributing to open science and to open educational resources. So the story I want to share with you is not only my story, it's the story of 193 medical schools which participate in an organization called IFMSA Brazil. Okay, tricky name, I know. But IFMSA Brazil means the International Federation of Medical Students Associations of Brazil, which represents more than 5,000 medical uh, students from Brazil. And it's really a place which I learned to call home. In, in which I served as National Officer for Research Exchanges. And last year, I was the local president of my local committee associated to IFMSA Brazil and also the general assistant of uh, IFMSA Brazil's scientific team, in which I'm going to explain to you right now. So IFMSA Brazil has this different aspect of it. So since 2016, IFMSA Brazil has launched what we call the publications and research access. This means that IFMSA Brazil has the commitment to provide access to research and research education to all its affiliated members and to capacitate people in research. And this includes spreading the word of open educational resources. And how do we do that? So IFMSA Brazil has this structure which functions in the national, regional and local level. So we have the national officer on publications and research, and he or she 
has its own team that we call the scientific team in which I was able to join last year. And together, this scientific team brings to the medical schools associated to Life MSA Brazil, the world of research, the world of open science. And we actually want students to be empowered and to be research leaders in their own education. And I can tell you many different experiences, but I wanted to give to you something practical, something that you can feel and that you can take as example. So I'm going to tell you a very interesting story. So one day, as general assistant, I was talking the WhatsApp group with our members. And then this question came up, hey, am I the only one struggling to learn biostatistics? And then the following messages came as follow, like, oh, no, you're not alone. I'm definitely, I definitely need to uh, some help to learn biostatistics. Man, I don't know at all. I don't know which books to read. I don't know which software to use. And then I noticed this pattern. Many medical students wanting to learn biostatistics, but no assistance at all to help. No professor was interested in helping us. And then there is a secret. In IFMSA Brazil, we believe in peer education about students educating other students for students. And then when I noticed this pattern, I said, hey, what about bringing these interested people together? And we actually start to learn about statistics from ground zero. And then on the other day, we created this group with 50 interested people and then we divided these 50 people into small working groups and that's how it goes. So each small working group needed to provide a lecture to the other groups about a certain topic of statistics. Okay, but not only the lecture, we needed to provide many other resources and then we started to struggle and that's the importance of uh, OER. So our first question was, okay, software are going to is it going to be an easy one is it going to be a difficult one uh, is it free is it accessible so our first question second question okay we now have another problem which book are we going to use as basis to learn and then after we had uh, passed through these struggles we set our basis our books and software and everything and then each group started to make their own educational resources about the statistics. So they did short videos, short tutorials explaining uh, some concepts or how to use the software in order to do a certain test. Uh, after, besides these, we did our own exercises. So after the lecture, here you have these exercises so you can practice both the theory and the practice that you learned during the lecture. We did files of three pages long to explain very complicated concepts of the statistics. So this is an example of some of the things that we did. Uh, besides that, I can say, for example, that the scientific team in which I participated, uh, we do a series of different webinars in order to teach other students about many different aspects of science and about open science. And then at the end of each webinar, we launch a new material, a new resource, so they can actually be the leaders of their own education. And as open educational resource, I can say something that happened last year and that I'm really proud of being on the people which launched the idea in IFMSA Brazil. Last year, uh, IFMSA Brazil hosted its first um, workshop about training new research trainers. And then we explained lots of things and we stimulate these students who are now trainers on research to advocate for open educational resources. So I was in the pilot project. It was very challenging. Some of the people that are here on this call were part of the organizing committee. And really, I know that I only have five minutes. It's a very short time. I wish I could tell um, many other experiences that I, I participated in IFMSA Brazil. But something that I can say is that 
you know, if I must say Brazil, I realized how powerful students are, how many difference we can make. And we need to rely actually in peer education. If students are able to teach new things to other students, are able to give them the voice, the power, the freedom, so they can pursue the research career. So really, I'm very honored to be in IFMSA Brazil and for all the, these experiences. And now I'm totally open for questions. Thank you, Leticia. And thanks again to our four guests for sharing your experience and for bringing, it sounds like, a lot of other people to the call who can also contribute to the conversation. So um, we welcome all of you to chime in. This is now your time. We have about half an hour left together. And looking to the chat, it looks like our first question is from Esperanza. She is curious for any of you how COVID has impacted the work that you've been doing. If you just want us to jump in. Um, jump on I'm, in. Okay, I'm happy to do that. So here in Louisiana, um, COVID obviously has as it has across the country, dealt us an additional blow. Um, so we have in our state been um, historically underfunded when it comes to higher education and higher education initiatives. In addition to COVID, we've had two devastating hurricanes to hit our state um, at the same time. And now we're going through freezing conditions in our state, just whether that has kind of disabled the northern portion of our state. So we've had a rough go of it lately. Um, when COVID hit, um, what we recognized was that before we could continue to advance OER initiatives, we had to work on bridging the digital divide, right? We have a big population of haves and have nots in our state. And in order to um, tout the benefits of OER, we had to address the digital divide and implement solutions at scale to ensure that um, we were reducing barriers um, to attendance and completion for our students, for our student leaders and across the state. Um, and so, we you know, had to take a kind of step back to take a step forward. Uh, and so those initiatives, which I think will pay dividends in the future, um, have allowed us to work on connectivity issues for our students. Um, and some that, you know, even devices, you know, we had students that were driving to area restaurants to sit outside to try to pull up textbooks on their cell phones. Uh, and so we had to work on um, device distribution and Wi-Fi hotspot access for our students. And um, our libraries were key across the state in offering um, access to, to internet and, and Wi-Fi spots for our students to continue that work. And so I think, um, you know, COVID caused us to pivot in a number of ways that we obviously weren't prepared for, but has also allowed us to be able to be more intentional with our student leaders and our student leaderships on campus um, to have an increased focus on on that, uh, you know, so bridging the digital divide, but also on addressing barriers to completion for our students. And so with our student leaders and our groups on campus, we have really had to also work on increasing their motivation um, and being proactive in terms of our outreach to them. So we've had weekly calls and emails with our student body presidents throughout, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, now those have transitioned to kind of bi-weekly or monthly just depending on what's going on out there. And I think it's made us be more intentional about how we're spreading the messages, how we're getting the word out, how we're still continuing to elevate um, conversations about OER and the importance of access and what that also allows them to do in terms of affordability in times where resources are tight. Mm -hmm. And Nick, I believe I saw you unmuting earlier. So did you also have anything to say um, about yeah. how the pandemic has impacted your work? I, th I think um, I first want to start off by saying um, if, there, if there wasn't an excuse before to include students in conversations, there certainly isn't now because we have Zoom. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen is, is now it's, it's even easier to bring more people to the table. Um, and, and as we go forward with, that, with advocating for whatever you're advocating for in whatever space you're in, it's something to know. But I think for us at Carolina, we've, we've seen that, that COVID has just um, highlighted the pressure points that were already there. Um, a lot of issues that we neglected, honestly, for years and years and years, they, they came to the forefront because of this new form of remote instruction. 
Uh, and speaking, coming from a, an institution like Carolina that, I mean, we were founded in, in 1789. A lot of our classes still teach like they were in 1789. We were not ready. Um, so we, we had to learn and adapt. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the class features tool early on, that is a feature that came completely out of COVID. It's a silver lining of COVID, um, where we found that during this time, students needed more information. It was now no longer okay to say, sign up for classes however you want. Good advising if, if you need questions, go to the student stores if you want a textbook. You can't just do that anymore. There's, there's, there's more nuance, there's, there's more barriers. Um, so we found that we needed to be more transparent parent to bring more people to the table. Um, and, and through that, through those conversations, we were able to kind of get some of those things that we wanted for a while. We, for 10 years, we have came for open syllabi at Carolina. We finally got it um, because we, need, we realized that was something that students needed um, during this time where there was all this confusion. Um, we, we'd been advocating for course marking. Um, for to have tech, uh, uh, textbook prices, um, the, the uh, like form of textbook or of material, um, we've been advocating for that to be available um, at registration or before registration for ages. Um, I, I've been screaming about that for, for years now. And we finally got that because of COVID. So I think as we move forward, first of all, learning that um, if issues come forward, if students are, are, are recognizing that something's an issue, um, it is, uh, and, and it shouldn't take a pandemic um, to, to finally bring those issues to the forefront. Um, but in a way at Carolina, we found that it made, it made us finally take a step and, and, and uh, engage in, in these issues and find great solutions. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. I'll also say it's, it's been one of those things where again, with Zoom, it, it, it's more important than ever to bring people to the, to the conversation. So hopefully that helps. There are so many opportunities to communicate. I think both of you are, are highlighting um, the necessity for keeping those channels open, listening deeply, and the power of the pandemic to ideally anyway, accelerate a lot of delayed um, issues. All right. Leticia. Um, pause to pause. Oh. Looks like uh, Leticia also had a hand up. So I think she may have wanted to talk about how the pandemic has affected her work. Yes, thank you. Let me just lower my hand. Okay, so regarding that, uh, I just need to briefly explain to you something. So for I from say Brazil to work with more than 190 medical schools, I think you can already believe that most of our communication is online and through online resources. I guess you already uh, can feel that. But what I noticed with COVID-19 was in the past, uh, since medical students need to balance their career, uh, I mean, their medical school activities and their activities in IFMSA Brazil, sometimes they struggled with time, with resources on how to provide um, educational opportunities regarding OER, open science and other topics. And then, with COVID-19, since we needed some pause from academic uh, activities and most of the events went online, what we noticed was an increase in demand. So many more medical students were coming to us saying, hey, can you please help me with that? Hey, I, I want to make this activity about OER and I don't know where to start. Can you please help me on that? I really want to make this opportunity. And then we noticed this increase in demand among the medical students. So if I'm going to analyze the work that IFMC Brazil does internally, the demand has increased because of this opportunity and because a virtual communication was enhanced because of the pandemic. But when I analyze in the perspectives of I from say Brazil with other stakeholders depends on which kind of um, partnership we wanted to do. So, for example, some of um, our stakeholders were unavailable to make some collaborations to promote some partnership um, activities because of the pandemic and they needed to focus more on certain projects that they were carrying on. Some other stakeholders were like, hey, this is the moment for us to unite. The moment is now, we need to do something together. And then, um, so internally, the 
work was enhanced. When I analyze iPharmacy Brazil with other stakeholders, it depends on the area that they were focusing. But I noticed that um, these changes were coming up because of the pandemic. So I hope I answered Esperanza on that. Thank you, Leticia. It's great to hear about the increase in interest and support for OER. That's something that um, I think we were all hoping to see and was or wasn't happening depending on the pressures of, of the circumstances for many, um, just dealing with you know, some of the issues that Nikki raised. So to hear that there was this demand for, hey, I need support in creating and sharing OER is, is exciting. Okay. I'm going to turn back to the chat. Yep. And oh, go okay. Uh, Emily Frank, uh, who is with Lewis, says In a previous role, my colleagues and I developed a strong collaboration with student government leadership. But then the year ended, students graduated, and we started at square one the next year. Do you all have recommendations for building in sustainability and developing longer term relationships when there will naturally be students coming and going? Akansha, I wonder if you have perspective, just given that you're working with so many different student lobby groups where representatives might be changing as students graduate or um, new members come into those groups. Yeah, absolutely. I actually do. I think that um, I have a lot to say about this for exactly that reason. I think that it's the student life cycle is something that is really important to absolutely understand, like when the elections are on your campus, when student leaders are going to be turning over and when student leaders are gonna be starting their transition processes. I think that that's one thing that student leaders have done really well is they do have embedded processes to transition their incoming teams and their incoming portfolios. So making sure that you know when um, those are providing people the ability to say, you know, I know your transition is coming up. I know your term is ending. You know, here's a one page summary of what we've done over this year that I hope that you can pass on to your successor. and you know, once your successor has been elected, I would love to meet with you, them, and myself, like one-on-one -on -one or your, your team. I think that that initial um, piece of contact is so important. And that was a big reason that I stayed connected with my open community when I was a student leader is that when I had, um, you know, successfully won the election, our, my VP academic at the time had introduced me to our open education librarian. And I was able to build that connection even before I had started officially my role. So I think that it's really important to know what the cycle on your campus looks like and be able to, to find those areas of influence. And the second thing I'll say is that typically um, in Canada, student associations are coupled with an, with an organization behind them, whether that's a general manager or you know a few full-time staff members. I think that if you build a positive relationship with a student leader, um, you can build a positive relationship with their staff as well to be able to to have that conversation uh, more full time. So for example, the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations, CASA, where I work right now, we're full-time uh, employees who have graduated. I say with uh, quotation marks because I'm still completing my degree, but uh, who have basically graduated who are here, you know, full-time regardless of the student life cycle. So having relationships with organizations that have uh, less turnaround would be great because we're able to make those connections for you. Um, like as quickly as possible or with whoever you would like to make them with. So I do think that understanding the student life cycle is really important and creating those um, points of continuity and those points of contact for student leaders just to make it easier for them once they've started their role to be able to continue to prioritize and focus on open. Because once you're in the job, and I'm sure any student leader can attest to this, there's always a thousand different emergencies that you need to decide and you only get to really focus on a few and anything that you can do to really make um, their transition or their integration and open easier or simpler, the more likely they are to, to connect with you on, on those issues. If I can add on to that, 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 that is, you're, you're spot on. Um, it, so it's interesting, and I think there's kind of two, uh, two ways to go at this. Um, when I was undergrad chief of staff, of course, uh, affordability was just one of 10 committees I, I oversaw. Um, and luckily, it was, it was kind of my, it was the issue I, I love, so I, I kept an eye on it. But um, I think your, your point is very well taken. You, you, it's really important to understand the institution. Um, so when are those elections going to be? But it's even more important to speak with leaders and make sure there's transition guides in place um, that um, whoever, because typically student governments have um, an advisor, make sure their advisors kind of cued into what's going on. But it, quite frankly, if you can, um, if you can, like, give someone a one pager of what happened at the end of the year. If the, uh, 
that that right there, that never happened for us. But like, I, I'm sitting here going, oh my God, that's incredible. If, if I had that from a partner on campus, I'd be, I'd, I'd be so excited to be like, uh, it'd be like Christmas. So uh, that, that's, that's incredible. Um, absolutely love that idea. Um, one thing I will say is if you're working with codified groups or codified positions, you've already kind of started out from a, um, from a good place. And if, and if you're not, it's really important to work with your institution to make sure those, those roles are codified, whether they're through um, a, a student, uh, constitution, um, student code, whatever it may be, make sure that there's something on the paper, making sure that one of these positions, especially in a student government is gonna be there year to year is really is really important. Cause then you actually have that point of contact going forward. Um, but when you kind of look at organizations that aren't part of student government, then it gets a little more complicated. Um, with that, what I was always recommend is making sure that they have a good relationship with those codified positions. So what we did at, at Carolina, um, of course, I was able to like, uh, transition from, from NCPIRG, which is a non-codified, just regular or registered student organization, to a student government. What I made sure to do was connect um, my predecessor uh, in, in NCPIRG um, with our uh, um, affordability co-chairs in student government um, to make sure that that relationship would be there year to year. Um, and I think it's also important, too, because is, um, you're dealing with, with students who are every aspect of, of kind of, of you, you're, you have first years, you have sophomores, you have seniors, juniors, it, 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 there's, there's, there's quite a range there. So making sure that you can kind of create those relationships and those coalitions is going to help you a lot. But the biggest thing is, um, is transition guides, write it down, keep a record, keep it in a secure Google Drive. Um, there, I've met so many student leaders across the country who still like have like paper files don't, no, Google Drive, it's great, um, or OneDrive, whatever. but um, yeah, uh, I, I think that's the biggest thing. And then again, work with advisors and, and um, I'm seeing so, yeah, uh, yeah, no paper files. Um, but yeah, and then working with their advisors is really important too. And I think for us um, in Louisiana, everything that you guys have just said, um, obviously your best practices, we do host transition meetings. And I think the benefit of us having um, an organization of our student body presidents is that we have two full-time staff persons who support um, that work. And so we're able to kind of transition things through um, staff as well. But I will say that we have tried to, within this past year, become intentional about um, being more inclusive. So in addition to working with student body presidents, we will also host most listening sessions. So whether that's, you know, we'll reach out to your campus and say, hey, Nicholas, we want to come and speak. Make sure you have representatives from your freshman class on through your senior class on. And so we're speaking to cabinets. We're speaking more broadly to student government associations. We're speaking more broad broadly to Greek organizations. Um, we're speaking more broadly to campus organizations. And so, for example, we have a listening session next week. It was supposed to be tomorrow, but again, weather here. Um, we have a listening session next week with our commissioner of higher education education who just wants to hear from students about what is school looking like for you now? What is COVID looking like? What are some other things that we can do to support your experience? Is, you know, are there any questions? And so I think those opportunities allow us the chance to hear directly from students, but to also have them engaged in the work um, on a continuous basis so that it's not just at a transition period at the end of the year, but they know what we're doing year round. And so we try to host those at least quarterly. So if there's a hot topic coming up, like when we're going back to the legislature and asking for more funding or support for our OER initiatives, um, students hear about that. They hear about it. They let us know what their experience has been like with the textbooks and with access and logging on and paying for course codes and you know all of those things. So they hear about it and then they see us discussing that in the legislature and bringing it forward. And so they're really eager to participate. Now we have to kind of put a cap on the numbers that we can, uh, can allow. But I think us kind of taking a more proactive approach to having that year round dialogue with a broader scope of students on campus from their freshman year. And you know they're always idealistic and thinking, hey, this is great, everything's fine to the sophomores, junior and senior year. And our, even our graduate students, our law students and our medical school students are also very unique. I think the message that that we have to learn and you know that we are still reminding ourselves about is that um, they all have unique experiences and, and also deserve to be heard. And so we're trying to be more intentional about doing that again throughout the year instead of just waiting until that transition period. And then also remembering and reminding ourselves to do those key things that make those transitions easier that you guys have mentioned. One thing I'll add on to that too is it's really important to when you do bring students to this table, diversify 
just the, the people you're bringing. So don't just always bring the same student because that's the student that who you know is really interested in this has always come to these meetings. Reach out, try to make sure that you're, you're planning ahead there. And then in, with transition guides too, keep a note of communications. Who has, uh, who on, on an administrative level has been brought into these conversations and make a list. Because I know as someone who moved into a lot of these roles, it was really helpful to come in and say, oh, I know my, my predecessor met with X people and then I can reach out and, and get ahead of things too. So, um, I would like also to add to this question because uh, transition period is something that I experienced a lot because I took many different positions over these last four years. So, I really would like to provide some advice to, to Emily. Thank you for your question, by the way. Uh, so, in IFMSA Brazil, I learned a cultural thing that I, I believe it needs to be taught in any organization. If your term, independently of the position that you are supposed in, only ends when your successor's term ends. This is the main rule of the handover process about making a smoother transition period. So there are some very uh, simple rules that you can follow. So for example, since you're assuming a certain position, a certain um, role in your organization, imagine that you have this institutional commitment of memory. So don't use your personal email, only use the institutional, the official email, for example. Any important files, don't put on, on your personal Google Drive. Don't put on your OneDrive account. Put on the institutional, the official account. So the, the thing to sustain organization needs to start on your term. So separate each file, each important document or anything else in a way that your successor will be able to easily find and to easily track. So this is one important advice. Uh, when you start the handover, it's not only about saying, hey, so this year we did A, B, C, D, E, F, G and the entire alphabet. It's not only making this list, it's about teaching developing skills on your successor. So for example, in case you're advocating for OER, you need to be on spot with communication skills. You need to, uh, you, you need to know how to communicate, how to manage with stakeholders in case you want to spread OER. So one example, I can teach you as, your, um, as my successor how to communicate with stakeholders, how to manage them, how uh, to shape your leadership skills. So handover process is not only about uh, handing over a list of points that happen during the year, it's about handing over abilities, competencies that you need to, uh, to execute, to carry your work in proper manner. So this is the beauty of handover. And another, and this is the my last point on that, is in case your organization has any kind of bylaws or any document similar to it, put as obligation to any director to uh, make a handover process with their successors and not only making a handover, but put a period for that. So for example, in IFMSA Brazil, when we are changing executive boards, each member from the previous executive board needs to provide handover in 60 days from uh, the election of the new executive board. So these three tips will uh, help you out in sustaining your organization. Thank you all. All, all such really wonderful practical recommendations. Um, we have 10 minutes remaining and two more questions that I know of in the chat. So I'm going to turn to Haley's question with a note about Nancy's question, which is just after Haley's. So um, I'm going to mention Nancy and then go back to Haley. So Nancy says, with Open Education Week coming up, are there any events or promotions that have worked in the past that we could try to do this year? I'm guessing that there may be people in this call who could also drop in suggestions for Nancy, um, things that you've tried in the past. So let's, let's earmark that one. And then Haley's asking, what is something you wish faculty administrators and decision makers knew about the student leadership experience? Hopefully we can address both of these, but just in case we run out of time, I wanted to put in a plug for Nancy's question there. 
So um, what do you wish faculty administrators and decision makers knew about the student leadership experience that we may not have mentioned so far? I guess I, I can start there. Uh, it, it's been interesting kind of being on both sides of, uh, of the admin student um, relationship there. And I think the biggest thing is these issues are real. And I think I don't think we we stop and pause and realize that sometimes where you think, oh, textbook it's a, it's a hundred dollars, great, that that's that's wonderful. But a hundred dollars times five classes or more, it, it that adds up, and that that's that's a real problem, and that that impacts if a student's going to pay rent, if a student's going to get one dining plan or the other, or if the student's even going to eat. Like these things are important, uh, and we need to stop and recognize that. Um, and, and with that, we shouldn't assume what the best solution is going to be for every student. There is no blanket option. Uh, and, and that's why when, when we bring in the discussion about access codes or these other types of materials, uh, those are chosen with the assumption that this is what's going to be easier for, for my student. That um, going to an access code, this online thing, that's what they want. Everyone wants online materials. Well, actually, a lot of students, in fact, the majority of students typically prefer tangible copies. And, and that, that adds to the OER argument because OER, one of, the, one of the best things is you can you can access it online. You can print it out and, and, and use it in person. OER is one thing I've always believed is one reason I've always believed it's a wonderful solution is because it gives students those options. So when you're in these administrative spaces, just make sure that when there is a problem that comes up, that students are the ones who point to the solution. That it's not just a, ah, that, that seems great. That sounds great from, from the pitch I heard from Pearson or McGraw. What do students really think? Um, and then along with that, give students the materials necessary to, um, to, to, to make that decision. Um, but students deserve to have a role at this table. Um, they deserve to have, or a, a seat at this table. They deserve to be included in these discussions. Uh, and so take, take it seriously and, and because it's, it's really important. And it's better for the institution um, from an from a le uh, academic a learning outcome, um, from a, a moral outcome. It, it's better for students and better for the institution when, they're, when students are at this uh, part of these discussions. And Karen, I can try to do a two for one and get both questions in two minutes. Um, so I think uh, what we continually have to remind is, you know, our administrators and, and even our professors to an extent is that today's student is a different student, right? So when we speak about today's student, there is no more traditional student. So when you're, you know, focusing on course materials and access and even timing of courses and, and those things, you know, we are now dealing with students who are trying to fit school into life and who aren't balancing life around school anymore, right? So whether that's our single parents, our veterans, our former justice involved youth, like, it, it's a different student. And I think we have to be cognizant and aware of that um, as it relates to, to these initiatives and what we're putting forward for our students. Um, I was gonna talk about Alexander Aston and go into some student involvement theory, but we'll do that at the next one. Um, but I think I, I would, what I would want them to know is that our students are largely looking for connection and ways to foster community. And there are opportunities to do that and to continue that work through opportunities like OER. Um, I'm gonna chime in to call on Emily Frank to give a one minute kind of little synopsis on some of the things that um, Lewis has been doing um, for, for OER week or in our open education week. Um, Emily is at our Lewis division. So two minutes, so I'll give you a one minute Emily of my time to just chime into that so we can tackle both questions. Yeah, and I shared in, in the chat um, and just a brief highlight, you know, we have a consortium of 47 members. So it is a challenge to coordinate everyone's schedules for synchronous live activities during open ed week. They may have actions going on on their campus at well. So what we've had success with in the past is focusing on more asynchronous activities that people can fit into their schedule as time allows. Um, something like watching a, a webinar or reading an article or diving deeper into something followed by some type of action and that could be an independent action um, or a, a more of a shared collective action where they share out um, on a listserv or through social media or somewhere else uh, something that came from that more reflective piece. 
and from a statewide standpoint. So um, whatever those initiatives are that Lewis engages in and, and provides for open for Open Education Week, um, the Board of Regents, of course, shares. We love social media campaigns, as most of our uh, colleagues do. And so we're able to elevate um, those initiatives on a statewide basis and within our four systems and also working with our um, the system that uh, oversees our private universities in the state as well. And so um, I think they've done a great job of elevating messaging, of um, working to really uh, garner support and make our campuses and our students and especially our faculty members, which can be a little a tougher challenge, but to make them advocates for, for this work. And I think they've done a great job in doing that. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, may I may I answer? Okay, thank you. Uh, Haley, I really loved your question. And this brings into a more in-depth point. Uh, your question just shows something that is presumed for students in general, that we are kids, that we don't know what we're doing, that we don't have enough skills, enough knowledge, and enough political power to make differences. And that's why we need to uh, make the mechanisms for make, to make our voices heard. So your question reflects this problem. So one thing that I wanted to comment on, um, in case we want to take, for being taken seriously, there are two things that we need to do. First thing, we need to make our, our organizations have power in social media. So if there is something that I learned from the many institutions that I'm part of is that social media has an advocacy power that you need to have as an ally. So the first thing, have strong social media profiles. So in case you're from a student organization and you want to advocate for OER, this is the first step. And have multiple types of our accounts, for example, in Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and tailor your message depending on the platform that you are and also in the target public that you want to reach. This is very important. And the second thing is about engaging in policy um, making processes. It can be with all the stakeholders and it can be also the writing of the organization's own policy documents. Uh, organization without any kind of policy, without any kind of position paper, is an organization that doesn't have a voice, that doesn't have the right to call for action, that it doesn't have a formal statement towards an issue. So these two things are really important in case we want to make our voices heard. And in case we internally organize ourselves in that manner, stakeholders will know our message, we know uh, what we desire, and we'll know how to advocate with them. So this is my... Thanks so much, Leticia. And we are seconds away from the hour, and I think Everyone managed to fit in so much. You can tell everybody's uh, started accelerating their, their speech to try and fit in all of the information to, and share with the community in our limited amount of time. But before we adjourn, please join us in thanking Ashanksa, Nikki, Nick, and Leticia for joining us today and sharing their expertise. And um, look forward to meeting again and continuing the conversation about open educational practices. Aperva. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to pause to see if Akanksha had any final words to share on her part as well. Um, I don't know if you managed to get the squeeze in in the last two minutes. I know we are at time, but I'm okay, uh, Akanksha, to listen to your final words of wisdom before we say goodbye for another month. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. I'll be uh, really quick here. Uh, a quick thing with my comms hat on and my student hat on is that uh, you need to make sure that you're not using jargon like open education when you're talking to students and give them the actual tools and the language toolkit to be able to be self-advocates. So when I was a student leader, I started this program called the Be Book Smart Fair that we hosted in person um, during the beginning of the semester. So maybe not so great for a wee week, but uh, we did it before the ad drop deadline for classes so that students could drop their classes if they weren't getting an affordable textbook. But we gave them templates on how to email their profs to ask for more affordable textbooks. I've linked it in the um, like the chat box, but 
it was moved digitally this year and I think it's well done. So my, my number one tip is try to avoid jargon and meet students where they are because oftentimes they are on the same side as you, but you're using words like open education, pedagogy, and they're thinking, I want a free textbook. So rope them in somehow and keep them in the movement because that's exactly how I got here. Thank you so much, Akanksha. I think that comes back to um, what Nick had earlier too, is try to connect students at the core of, of the issue in ways that you know um, will really um, resonate with them. So I really appreciate um, your words of wisdom as well. Um, and thank you to uh, Nikki, to Leticia, to Nick, to Akanksha, and all of our attendees for this rich conversation today. Um, I wish we had more time to keep chatting, but it looks like we may need to continue the conversation um, in the Rebus Forum or maybe at future office hour sessions. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure. So thank you all. Um, and I will ask all of our uh, attendees to thank our guests as well. And Karen, um, did you have any final words? Just another thank you. All right. Well, see you all hopefully next month, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye and thank you. Bye-bye.